Thank you for watching. My name is Glenn Morgan and this is We the Governed. Well, all eyes are on Washington, D.C. as the chaos of the most bizarre inauguration in modern American history bumbles along for the history books. It's worth looking closer to home and seeing the political class's priorities in the other Washington. Now, Olympia is the capital of Washington state, and last week the legislative session began with a whimper and a bit of over-the-top drama, not including the National Guard stationed out front with behind big fences. So even though the Republicans and the Democrats are actually approaching this legislative session with the exact same number of votes in both houses as they had pre-COVID in last year's legislative session, the Democrat Party and Governor Inslee and their corporate sponsors seem to have reached peak arrogance and are certainly plunging ahead with all the bad ideas that they've failed to implement in the past. So let's focus on three issues that I believe merit attention right out of the gate. They are transparency, taxes, and transportation. And these are the three issues which, in a uh, Tourette's syndrome sort of response, seem to automatically fall out of the mouth of politicians this year. Now, when we're talking about transparency, we're talking about less of it. When we're talking about taxes, we're talking about more of it. And we're talking about transportation, we're just talking about the typical transportation boondoggle called sound transit that never seems to end. But let's start with transparency. As always, the political class and their cronies want less of it. They may waste billions of your tax dollars on incredibly stupid things, like, for instance, this last summer, wasting just truckloads of cash to a Nigerian fraud scheme, which was uh, implemented and overseen by Governor Inslee's mega donor, Susie Levine, at the Employment Security Department last year. But, of course, they always say that it's transparency that is expensive. And, of course, transparency is also scary. And it is really scary because if you've ever actually bothered to research how government really works, you will become terrified and the people might just begin to question how and why government is so incompetent, wasteful, self-destructive, and harmful with the dollars that we send them. And so the solution entirely endorsed this time and supported by the Democratic Party at this time is to reduce transparency in government, starting with this legislative session. If you want to know why you can't petition your legislator this year on the bills that you don't want, and you have to thank the Democrats because this entire session will be conducted via a Zoom online meeting. And of course, committee meetings, which is where the real work is done on any legislative bill, public input's entirely missing because you're not going to have any access to it since they're going to be on Microsoft Teams. So the transparency there is even worse. And then the voting, where the legislators actually go to cast their votes, that's going to be done on some kind of super secret software program. And does this sound like it's going to be a great idea to you? Now, with the legislators barred from their offices, no floor sessions, and a total ban on citizens ac accessing the Capitol campus at all, thanks to the uh, National Guard and their big fences, then the legislature can conveniently avoid the problems that happened a couple years ago when they had this poorly thought out bill and they, that they had proposed at the time for that the, lead, the uh, hairdressers decided was going to be a very destructive thing for their businesses. And so with only a couple days notice, about 1,500 uh, hairdressers showed up and flooded the Capitol to uh, protest the bill, to confront the legislators, to have a protest out front. And they were not happy. They were pretty angry about this bill. And because they all showed up in, in Olympia, it really made a big impact and it killed the bill. Now, because of this time, this legislative session, that is going to be impossible. This year, that's not going to happen. And that was purely a partisan push this time. Originally, the plan was not to vote on these remote session rules. They were going to pass these rules and then not really let you know about it. But the political leadership, they, of course, didn't want to have a formal vote on it. However, thanks to a procedural move by Republican Representative Jesse Young, uh, right as the session opened last week, the rules implementing this remote Zoom-only legislative session were formally voted on by the legislators, and every Republican opposed them and every Democrat supported them. So at least you know who wants this type of a legislative session this year. So your testimony, if you are able to get it in at all, where it's going to be remotely done, that's assuming, of course, that they want to hear from you. And if you can avoid getting your remote testimony conveniently glitched, and I can see this right now, as you try to log on to the legislature, you try to get in there to get your testimony heard, and you don't happen to support the current tax scheme that they're proposing in that bill, you're going to get zapped off Zoom. Now, the special interests in Olympia, I'm sure they're jumping for joy at the ability to work behind the scenes and probably behind the screens of the elected officials at their home offices, giving them little talking points because they want to keep their hands on your cash and they want your freedoms. So, but we're not going to have any way of knowing exactly how that's going because 
it's all going to be concealed from the public. None of us are going to be able to see. At least when you're at the Capitol in a normal legislative session, you're able to see who the legislators are talking to in the hallways or who they're stepping out of committee meetings to meet with kind of on the side. But all that's going to be gone. You're going to see nothing like that. You're going to have no idea. Now, that wasn't the only push against transparency this year with a very contentious election cycle behind us and many questions that were raised about election integrity and related problems, a handful of hardened leftists in the Democratic caucus, they decided that this was the optimal time to remove as much transparency as possible from the election process in the state to make it impossible for you to figure out what kind of uh, integrity uh, efforts are being made, what kind of voter security is being made. They want to eliminate your access to any of that so you have no idea what's actually going on. And they made national news by proposing this in House Bill 1068, which is going to deny, if it passes, it's going to deny the public access to many of these aspects of security in the election process that's already really opaque uh, to the voters right now. Nobody can really tell exactly what happens with some of these different election security processes. And uh, Governor Inslee has already signaled that he's going to support this tr transparency destroying bill. And it seems almost perfectly timed to f feed fuel to the fire of all the conspiracy theories and probably create new ones out there about all these goofy elections from this last cycle in the state. Now, on top of this, to the proposal by the Democrats to maintain Governor Inslee's lockdown forever was also a purely partisan love fest of destruction to the small businesses and the communities of the state. It was not a popular proposal. And this was evidenced actually by the fact that Democrat Speaker of the House, Lori Jenkins, actually gave a pass. She let three of the Democrat legislators, one from the 10th legislative district and two from the 42nd, vote against it. And this was a calculated move because it's viewed those legislators, those Democrat legislators, are very vulnerable and these lockdown forever orders are very unpopular in those districts. So she gave them an exemption and allowed them to vote against it. Otherwise, it was just bipartisan, or I should say, uh, very partisan on which side of the fence you stood. The Republicans were opposed to lockdowns forever. The Democrats supported lockdowns forever. And uh, it's pretty crazy. Uh, it also indicates, by the way, just how unpopular and how much everybody knows these are unpopular outside of downtown Seattle or perhaps some wealthy suburbs uh, that are filled with maybe programmers from Amazon and Microsoft who are largely unaffected by these lockdowns. So this is a pretty significant um, Pretty significant and disheartening thing, I think, for most of the people who live in the state that wanted the lockdowns to end at some point in time. Now, the Republicans were unified in their opposition to giving Governor Inslee a terminal mandate and a blank check to ramp up his abuse of the people in Washington state with this lockdown forever world. Now, the unconstitutional part of this was the fact that they wouldn't even set an end date to Inslee's plan. There's no end date. Uh, normally, if you're going to give the governor a little bit of uh, you know, power to go do something, you do set an end date on that. So you say, uh, you know, we'll let you do this for a certain period of time, and then we want to come back and check it. They just gave him a blank check forever, no end date, which is probably illegal. Courts in other states have uh, thrown that out, but you know, this is Washington, and that's where they're at. Another interesting thing about that debate and drama uh, was the fact that Speaker Jenkins allowed uh, Democrat Representative Monica Stonier, who's from Clark County, uh, to give her speech in support of the lockdowns forever from the floor of the House. Now, the Republicans caucus, they've been denied access entirely to the camp, Capitol campus. They'll occasionally they'll let as many as 15 of them on sometimes, and they'll go lock down just up in the room, but they can't get out on the floor. But the, the Democrats allowed a, a Democrat legislator, of course, to give her speech from the floor that was uh, basically banned from everybody else, including the public. Now, the, uh, it's not the only tone-deaf piece of ignorance that's being proposed um, this legislative session. Taxes, of course, are coming. And taxes and more of them always seem to be the objective of our left-leaning friends in government. It's almost become like a religious mantra among most of them that we're only two to three tax hikes away from guaranteed utopia. Of course, one man's utopia can become another man's hell, but since those in charge today want more cash for their political donors, friends, and other government grant grifters, they can only increase the gravy going out on the train by taking more cash from you and I. And that's just the way the modern regressive progressive thinks. And since the Democrats at the time control all the seats in the legislature and their agendas are the ones being pushed, and not that all of them are going to succeed, but they certainly seem to be excited about trying to push for them for now. Which brings us to Inslee's big tax dream. He wants a capital gains tax. Now, a capital gains tax is just the latest version of an income tax for Washington State. 
and one of the very few competitive advantages for Washington State for entrepreneurs and others who want to maybe move their business or keep their business in the state is the fact that we don't have an income tax. Um, you know, it's actually not our weather that attracts people to Washington, but this happens to be one of those key uh, advantages. However, since there's no greed greater than the greed of government bureaucrats and those who want to get wealthy from the labor of others, uh, basically the labor of those of us who are willing to pay taxes, then it's always been their dream to impose an income tax in Washington state. And for over 100 years, this effort has failed. In addition to constitutional obstacles to this tax, the voters of the state have repeatedly rejected every proposal to have income taxes in the state. Now, most notably, there was an effort in 2010 that was funded by Bill Gates to approve an income tax, which actually failed with 66% of the people in opposition. So it really shows that taxes are tough, and especially income taxes. And so Governor Inslee's never met a tax he doesn't like, and he's figuring that he has a tame Democratic caucus in both houses who will push and promote his agenda. So although it's failed several times in the recent past, perhaps with the National Guard deployed around the Capitol and a total prohibition on in-person testimony to the legislature, uh, maybe he believes he can push it through this time. And it does seem like that's kind of one of the pushes that they have. We'll see. But on top of that, he's also pushing his favorite, which is a carbon tax, which is this carbon tax bill that essentially is going to be used to kick cash out to a variety of friends in the green movement. Now, however, they want to define the green movement. Many refer to this as the gang green plan. Now, if it passes, then gasoline is going to be at least 30 cents more expensive per gallon than it is right now, which primarily harms lower income people. But it's expected that the biggest beneficiary of this project is actually going to be uh, the Sound Transit 3 project, which was uh, another multi-billion dollar boondoggle, uh, which was pretending to push 19th century technology, you know, trains, into the 21st century world and then claiming that that is progress. But of, unlike generations in the past where building trains was a pretty predictable process, today it's a lot more expensive disaster and the billions of taxpayer dollars that are squandered in this enterprise dwarf all the transportation projects that are on the drawing board. The $53 billion that came through with the Sound Transit uh, 3 proposal, uh, that's just going to be lost and vanish, uh, and it's probably not enough, and they're probably going to lose the money, and they aren't going to be able to do what they said they were going to do. So they always want more, and this carbon tax is a good way to kind of shift money and eventually make sure it gets back into uh, trains, 19th century technology. Now, of course, the people most fearful about pandemics right now are wisely avoiding all public transportation options. And this is ev so this has affected the e already very anemic ridership numbers that were indicated that we'd seen pre-lockdown world. So it just seems like a perfect time to keep dumping more cash into an endless money pit called the light rail project and then pretending that somehow this is going to solve traffic congestion. And we're going to solve it in the most expensive, archaic way possible. Now, sometimes they might call these jobs programs or grant, gifting, uh, grant grifting kickbacks, but uh, sending this money back to well-heeled friends who profit from the waste. But whatever the story, the taxpayers are footing the bill, and it's certainly back in the agenda uh, at the Washington State Legislature this year. Now, the carbon tax push has failed many times before in Olympia. Twice voters have rejected it at the ballot box when it was put forward as initiative to the people. But, uh, and then a handful of times it's died in the legislature as well, but it's coming back around. It's one of Inslee's signature failures and he wants to keep pushing that. So we're just in this weird little window of time in the political world at the national level, certainly bizarre at the national level, and closer to home, the political class in power does seem content to use that DC chaos as kind of cover for the weak ideas that they want to sneak through while everybody's distracted by what's going on back in DC. But anything can still happen and nothing is set in stone. However, even if we want to throw our hands up in despair and we try to ignore politics, we wish we'd just go home and they'd leave us alone, uh, we can't, it, none of this desire is going to stop the fact that the politicians are going to continue to care about us. And really not so much caring about us, but they at least are going to care about what they believe they can extract from us uh, in terms of our money, our property, and our freedom. So we don't really have any choice. We have to engage and we have to tell them what we really think about their schemes. And they need to know that we're watching them. I think this matters. They may be getting their cronies in the tame media to kind of be silent or to even be cheerleaders. They might get uh, their donors in big tech to try to silence us and try to censor us and then intimidate us so that we're afraid to actually speak up. But uh, we're still watching. And I believe it's important for us to confront them in whatever way we can so that they know that we're paying attention. And I think part of this is just getting organized. Um, coordinate with other local groups who are concerned about the same issues that you are. 
uh, you're not alone. There's plenty of other people who feel the same way you do, and they're just as disgusted and just as demoralized about the corruption and the incompetence that they see in government. And the one thing to remember with, about corruption and incompetence is that a mountain of corruption is oftentimes concealed by an ocean of incompetence in government. So one of the best ways to confront all that is to get organized locally where you live, where you can make a bigger impact, uh, substantially bigger impact than you can on whatever clown shows going on back in DC. So stay in contact with your friends, your family and your neighbors and help the others around you who are having a hard time in this uh, lockdown world. A lot of people are losing their dreams and their businesses forever because of these ridiculous policies that are being imposed and they're not ending. And we see protests against them going on all around the world right now. And uh, people, I don't care if you live in uh, Germany or Sweden or the Netherlands or wherever these lockdowns now that are being implemented, uh, you're seeing people push back. You're not alone in this. But uh, the other part about that is just be as prepared as you can to help your family and your neighbors and your friends as you can be at home under whatever circumstances pop up. And then find new ways to communicate with those who share your concerns. If you were using Facebook before and like me, you got uh, you know, uh, suspended for a month for no reason, uh, then that's a pretty good indication that these guys are going to come in and keep censoring any of your ideas or anybody who dares to question authority or speak truth to power. So we have to come up with alternative ways of communicating with each other and being organized. And at the end, it all, the future, whatever that becomes, whatever that is, it ultimately belongs to those who show up. And I encourage you to make sure that you show up. Now, if I can also remind you, uh, I do, even though I'm not on Facebook right now since they suspended me, obviously you're watching this video right now, probably on YouTube. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. Uh, please share it with others. Uh, and also consider going to wethegovern.com. You can learn more about uh, some of the things that I've written about or other videos that are there. And I also encourage you to sign up for our email list at wethegovern.com. Leave your comments below. I do try to read them all and I'll respond to many of them uh, as I get the time. Thank you so much for watching.